You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Now here's a Jeopardy question. Who graduates Vassar with an elementary education certification, decides to be a lawyer, never becomes an elementary school teacher, never becomes a lawyer, eventually buys a small technical school with about four students, which today is Goodwin College. I'm Pat Kazakoff. You're watching Shalom Hartford. Stay with me, and we're going to meet that man, Mark Scheinberg. heard my intro. Yes. How did you not become a teacher? How did you not become a lawyer? I wish I could tell you that I had it all figured out. In fact, I think if anything helped me during those years, it was that I was not that afraid. So when I got out of Vassar, I had gotten into law school. I was actually on my way and I said, you know, I have to just take a break for a year. And so my break for that year was to go back to graduate school for what I, was, I thought was going to be a degree in early child education, which is, as you said, I've been certified in. So, um, but that didn't happen. No, it doesn't no. happen that way. And, and uh, I wish I could tell you there was some grand master plan, mm -hmm. but in steps what happened is that I had to be teaching. There were no teaching jobs to be had. And so I got together with a friend from school and we opened up a nonprofit daycare center in Bristol, Connecticut. And that's how I got to Connecticut because I was working in this daycare center. It was, seemed to be easier to start the business for you than to get a job as a teacher. Yeah, I, I, it's funny. Um, the process of doing that did not throw me, or most of those things don't throw me that much. And it was sort of an adventure. So uh, we, we opened that daycare center. And then what happened from there? Well, I did that for six months. And um, first of all, I don't remember ever taking a paycheck from it because it was a brand new little nonprofit right, center. Right. And so after the six months when I had my time in, I had to go find a real job. And my real job was at Moore School of Business in Hartford, Connecticut. I was an admissions and officer. And you were a good one, I heard. Oh, I loved it. It was so nice because you were dealing with uh, people who needed to do something different and better in their lives. And the job was not to tell them things, but just to listen to them and find out what their dreams were and try to plug that into. Uh, so how did that translate into you buying this little school data institute that had four students? How did that translate? Well, first of all, while we're talking about Morse, I have to give a shout out to Michael Taub, who mm -hmm. was the owner at that time, and uh, ran a really decent uh, ethical uh, school because I learned early in my career that you make choices and you have to be decent and ethical. And, um, and so I learned all the right things there. But two years in, now I'm 24 and I am itching to do something else. And in the Hartford Current, there was an ad in the back for, with a school for sale. I actually had another admissions officer and myself that went to go see this school, which cost almost nothing mm -hmm. because it was almost nothing. It was a, it was a little shell. Well, with, with students, <laughs> exactly. Because yeah. again, at that time, I think I'm all that. I'm bulletproof. I'm 24 years old. Well, and why do you think you thought you were bulletproof besides being 24 years old? Because I grew up uh, comparably poor. You know, I never was on state assistance in my family, but we always had government food. So we were, we were right there on the edge. And um, being poor growing, growing up gives you great freedom in certain ways. You, there is, uh, you feel like nothing really bad can ever happen to you. because well, you th Were you thinking about being poor? Was that, or it was just sort of natural? It was natural. I don't think I ever thought growing up I was poor because everybody was poor. Um, but in the process, if you think, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Let's say this thing blows up. Well, so what? Mm -hmm. So then you go do something else. And, um, and so you, you, you end up in a situation where you, you have less fear about cer certain of those things. So you take, you're looking at, at being poor as an advantage. Absolutely. Um, not only because of not having a bad outcome, but also because, I hate to say it, but my parents, I don't think, had a great model for what it is any of us would become. So you take a shot, no one's going to be disappointed in you. They can't believe you're trying out something, and if it doesn't work out, 
no one's upset. And it seems that they're not giving you, you know, you talk about the parents of today, there's like a lot of guidance and they call them helicopter parents. It, it didn't seem like you were brought up with parents who really had a lot of input in what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, where you should go to school, why you should go to school. My parents had no idea where I was most of the time. I don't think this, this is a good way to bring up kids. It's not <laughs> the way I bring up kids, mm -hmm. but my parents both worked. Um, no one pushed you to go to college. It, you know, when you're with a poor family, the idea was to join a union because you'll probably have a stable job. Uh, so, that, so that there was no expectation. And in the no expectation, if you want to do things, you have to own it. If you want to go to college, well, I had to own that. I had to do my own applications and do my, you know, I had you to. You had to do everything yourself. Yes. So you buy this data institute with the four students. Now what do you do? Well, um, I went three years, I guess, without a paycheck there as well. So I was really good about finding jobs that what had no paycheck. What did you do to make money? I played music for years and years. Locally, I played in some of the Jarvis bands. I played all over your little area here with, you know, every time there was a bas mitzvah or a bar mitzvah or a, or a wedding, I was, I was that band coming in from, what did from you Jarvis. Play? I was a bassist. Were you good? I was good at that age. You're good. You, know, I, you, know, you have to understand, as you get older, mm -hmm. You were better. You were better at sports. You were better. But I was, I was competent on base. So that's what you did to make money on the, on the weekends. That's what I did and to make money. And then during the week, you're running this thing. Yeah, I had, this, um, I had this, th this sort of hobby of running a school for 50, 60 hours a week. And then I'd go weekends and, and really make enough money to feed my family. So how did the school translate? Because I understand you had a few branches after a while. It started out as Data Institute. After those few years, we actually we were doing mostly work for nonprofit agencies, and so we were working a lot for the Urban League and Puerto Rican Forum and, and even Jewish Family Services. Was that common for technical schools to do that? Because you're talking about contracting here. Yes. So was that a common way of doing business, or was that unusual? It's unusual for it to be a mainstream. I think all places have certain contracts along the way, but it's not what you're focused on. For us, we had to be focused on it because that was our, that was our lifeblood. And also that you had like a large contingent of people coming from the Jewish community. Absolutely. It's, uh, one How did of those, that happen? Well, it's a great story. We were, we were running uh, a wonderful program in vocational English as a second language. So basically, our job was to get people within a short amount of time, I think it was eight months, from absolutely non-English speaking to speaking English well enough to be working. So it wasn't just a matter of learning how to do survival English, but can you carry a job with that English? Mm -hmm. And so um, we got very good at that. And at the time, uh, this was in the 90s, there was a lot of uh, Jews coming in from the Soviet Union. Right, Russians. All the Russian Jews were coming in. And uh, Jewish Family Services was looking for a partner to do some of that English as a second language work. And, and we were good at it. So they, uh, they chose us to do all that work for them which we did right on Farmington Avenue. And so that was the big boon. That, well, that was certainly, uh, that's certainly one of them. So basically most of your sales were to nonprofit, nonprofit agencies, am I correct? In the yes, yeah. yes. It, and were the other schools, were they doing that or were they more retail? Much more retail. Much more retail. So you were doing something different than other schools. Absolutely. Then how did it grow? Well, as we got our accreditations, as we had our uh, as you are able to actually use Title IV money, which is federal financial aid, more students on a retail basis could actually come to school there. And those services that we were doing for agencies work for the general public just as well, so that we started having regular commercial students coming in the door and more and more of that until we were opening branches and one in Milford, one in New Haven, one in Waterbury, one in Willimantic. Now, how many people did you have in your school once you were opening up the branches? We were probably up to 800 or 1,000 students. And how many years after you bought Data Institute? This is probably maybe 10 years after. Now, the other thing that you had mentioned was that you owned 40 apartments, and that was when you were 22, 24. Yeah, when I, when I was How still did that more. happen? Well, again, don't they say that every like, challenge is actually an opportunity? In Hartford... Well, they say that, but it's not clear that it is. <laughs> not well, clear that everybody takes that opportunity. That's per a better perhaps way of so, it. Perhaps so. Mm -hmm. But in the, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, you could not get a bank loan for any building in the city of Hartford. They had redlined the area, and I don't know, I don't know the legality of that, but the fact mm -hmm. is you could not get a bank loan for apartments in Hartford. 
And so I started buying apartments in the west end of Hartford. And you say, how do you do that? Right. Well, I was making enough money uh, at Morse that if you can get five or $10,000 together in cash, you could actually put it as a down payment on the apartment because the banks weren't involved and the owner would take back a, their, a mortgage on the property that so they were you, selling. So, you were, you, so the bank wasn't involved. It was just between you and the owner. Yes. So basically you approached the owner. Right. In many cases, the owner had the, the ad in the newspaper or after a while they got to know that you were doing this and so owners would... And so we're talking about $10,000 is not a lot of money, but you had that $10,000 because of, because of your business, because of Data Institute. No, I actually had the 10000 This is before Data Institute. So the $10,000 was just because I was working at Morse and I didn't have any need to buy a new car or buy a nice apartment or whatever. I, you lived, you lived you know, poor. You lived, you lived carefully. And putting that money together is something you could do maybe once a year. And so how does that poor look like? Like when you say you lived poor, what does that mean? Are you living in your, in your car? No, no. What's really okay, funny is so compared to growing up, I was living great. I had a, <laughs> I had a nice apartment with, with friends, but you don't, you, know, you don't have to have an apartment by yourself. Right. And so you'd have you know, three friends living in an apartment together. Um, I thought I was living you know, great. Well. Yeah, but, uh, but I didn't feel the need to blow money on things that didn't seem important to so me. So what didn't seem important to you that perhaps most people find important? Well, I think that that was the biggest one is I had no need for a car. I didn't have a need for an expensive apartment. I didn't have, I didn't go out to really nice places. I went out just fine, but it wouldn't be to a expensive place. So you place. made choices. Made choices. Made choices. So you're 10 years now into Data Institute. You have approximately 1,000 students, which is not insignificant. That's right. How do you make the change from that to Goodwin College? We had all these students that, were, that we were training and were finding jobs, and they were, doing, they were having great success finding work, which is why we were getting these contracts. But on the other hand, we told all of our students that this is only your first step. You really need to go back and get your degree so that you can keep on moving up uh, in your job. So that's a philosophy. That was a philosophical. Sure. Because you didn't have to advise them to go to college. That's true. That's true. Although if you're looking for, if you're looking to help somebody, you want to tell them what the whole story is, not okay. just the part that affects you. Okay. <laughs> um, so we were telling them to go back to college, but they had terrible luck getting colleges to accept the credits that we were offering as a technical school. So they would take all these programs with us and then go to the college and start from scratch again. They'd be back in Accounting 101 when they had taken six levels of accounting already, but they had to start from scratch. So how did you get, so I, I'm assuming that then you had to get certified as a college. Right, we decided that if the credit is going to mean anything, it has to be college credit. And so we felt like we were being forced into getting this credit recognizable as college credit and so we started going forward now to get ourselves. Now you're still a for-profit institution. That's correct. You're still an owner. That's correct. You're an owner. You're basically running a small business for, well, definition of, of right. a small business in America. That's, that's right. what you would be. How did you get certified? As a college. How? Even that is, uh, is interesting. I, we, we, uh, we were told it wasn't possible, actually. We were told that no one had made a switch in 40 years in Connecticut and that actually no one knew how to do it. So it was a lot of reading the regulations, taking one step at a time, getting blown off a lot. And You're accustomed to that. Yes. Right, because <laughs> of your upbringing, would you say? Uh, absolutely, yeah. and, and so you just, you just, you keep on pushing and you do it with humor and you do it, you know, you do it in a nice way. It doesn't have to be, matter of fact, you get a whole lot further if you're doing it with humor and, and, and being a nice person, but pushing all the time. Well, more so, uh, I would say the regulators, because for them, uh, this is an unusual thing, especially in Connecticut. Connecticut had very little in the way of uh, private owners of colleges. There has to be a narrative for why you didn't just stay as a for-profit institution. You had a thousand students. You could possibly sell that business oh, for yes. a lot more money. Um, in fact, when we, when we either then or just after we got our collegiate status, we were very valuable as an asset. So it got to be to the point where uh, I was being contacted quite regularly trying to have people that were trying to buy into a college and buy into the Connecticut market. So it was very valuable at that time. So as you asset. had two choices. The one choice was that you could have sold it. And the other choice was that you could have killed yourself trying to make it a college. 
Well, why did you choose choice B? We actually became a college as a for-profit. We were still for-profit when we, 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 we became the college. So, and that was a reaction to making sure our students got their credits respected. So, w once we became a college, however, um, we were also in the position where uh, the money that was being offered was, was and is very seductive. Mm -hmm. And so as a mom and pop, as I was telling you before, learning how to run a very ethical, careful place for students, I was very afraid personally that if this, if this thing, if this child of mine got adopted by one of the big chains, that it might be run in ways which I would not be happy with. And how old were you when you, because the money is very seductive. The money is very seductive. And it's very seductive at a certain age more than another age. How old were you when this dilemma, it's a moral dilemma also. It really is. Yeah. Um, but I was about 40. I was about 40 and, um, and to tell you the truth, uh, it's a very eccentric thing to do, to take this asset that was 90% of my net worth and, and give it away. Um, it's been very karmic, but it was pretty unusual. And so, um, to tell you the truth, I give most of the credit to my kids, and my wife and kids, because I had to sit them down and say, okay, I'm not sure what you think your birthright is mm -hmm. in this asset that's worth you know, tens of millions of dollars, but um, would you be okay if I give it away? And this is my reasoning. And so, by giving it away, it created, on a, from a business sense, a poison pill, because now it could not be bought and sold. Now it could not be sold to a chain either by me or by any of my kids or their kids. Mm -hmm. So it became something that would no longer be looked at that way. And so your kids must have been around 20 at that time? Yes, they 20 -ish. were. 20-ish? Yeah. What was their answer? They were wonderful. You know, they, they have been brought up in a family that really values service to the community and, and really valued the mission of the institution. And um, to their credit, they've worked really hard. They have their own professions. They have their own lives. And they weren't sitting on their heels waiting for this asset to come about. So they were great. They were Goodwin College. And it's a nonprofit yet? Yeah, it's a nonprofit by 2004. And so you become an employee? I become an employee of a nonprofit board. Right. I serve at their pleasure. How does that feel? You know, I wish I could tell you that it's not jarring at times, but it is because all of a sudden you have people who are, who are strong in the community, who have opinions, and it's your job to, to maintain those opinions. So any executive director of a nonprofit tries to have, you know, at least friendly and good, and good people go on a board, but you also have a board that has, has its own ideas and that's my job to fulfill their ideas. Hopefully they're not too much, you know. Right, so hopefully they're not too discordant, but it is the reality of being an employee. And not just an employee, but because I had given this away, the IRS required that I not be overly inured is the, I guess the word they used in the language, so that my salary is essentially the average of a president's salary of our peer institutions. I, they wanted to make sure that I didn't go nonprofit and then figure out some way to take money out the back door. So it's a very, uh, it's, it's very structured as, as to how that works. So we talked a little bit about your upbringing and you told me that your, um, uh, your father uh, was Jewish, yes. your name is Scheinberg, and your mother was not, and you were brought up um, in a Christian atmosphere. There That's weren't correct. a lot of Jews where you lived. This concept that you're talking about, I mean, you made a very big decision when you became an employee as opposed to an owner. It's very unusual. And my question to you is, even though you mentioned that there's not, you didn't have a Jewish education, you weren't brought up with Jewish people, do you think now looking back, you know, you're in your 60s, did the Jewish thing have something to do with it on some level, maybe? Well, first of all, we'll never know. Exactly. We'll but never I, but, know exactly. But, but, I, but I will tell you that um, there were certain cultural things that I did get from my father. There's certain appreciation of diversity. I, uh, I, I mentioned to you one of my proudest moments is finding out that my dad in the 40s was on a bus in Washington fighting the Jim Crow laws back before anyone had any clue that there was a problem in them. Um, so that there's a way of looking at the world, I think, actually, that is, that is, uh, that is not only religiously Jewish, but culturally Jewish. And so a lot of that, I think, 
you know, I give my father credit for that. I give, I give, uh, I give uh, even being in New York some credit for that. There, there is a sense of that. And what I don't, did your father do for a living? My dad was a carpenter, uh, and later in life he worked at Grumman Aircraft. So he was a hardworking guy who needed a lot of extra hours, so he'd work six, seven days a week. The name of the program is Shalom Hartford, yes. so we're a little Jew-centric here. <laughs> so do you have any sort of thoughts about how this Jewish thing plays into your life now? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Now is, this is a, a great time to sort of revisit this this part of my background that I don't think I fully comprehended years ago. I didn't know it was there. And so I'm finding myself enjoying, you know, sharing Jewish rituals with friends of mine and, and, go and learning parts of things that I did not know was part of me. And, and absolutely, uh, I will tell you, that I, my guess is that if you're Jewish and you're doing Jewish things, it is taken for granted because it, it is just what it is. When you're doing it on purpose, there is a there is this extra appreciation for understanding what what the what your purpose is, what the thought of the holidays are, what the um, it, it's it's been a, it's been a great way to revisit this thing that I missed when I was growing up. So it sounds like you like it. I like it. Yeah, you like it absolutely. Okay. And I and what a great Jewish community we have here because they're people even with the college are so generous and uh, helpful to us. Uh, you know, the, all, all the names that everyone knows, whether it's Jeff Hoffman or Alan Zowski or, you know, on and on and on. These are people that, that give of themselves every day. You're telling a story that's extremely entrepreneurial, even though you chose at quite an early age, like in your 40s, to become an employee. It, it's an unusual story. And you're telling a story of change. You know, first you went to the elementary education and then you wanted to be a lawyer. You didn't become a lawyer. And then you, then you became a for-profit institution, then a not-for-profit institution. It's a lot of change. You have a lot of people coming to your school now. How, you have approximately... Uh, 5,400 students. 5,400 students. It's a lot of people. And all those students, your, your institution is one, it's a professional-based institution yeah. that you're training kids to be, to work. That's correct. You're not training them to be in la-la land. Well, I don't know if anyone is trying to do that, but certainly our, we, we expect all of our students at the end that we're going to be able to help them find jobs. So your story, how would you share your story with one of your students? Like, how do you encourage your students to, to see that, as you said, poverty is an advantage? Well, it's funny. I, we all talk, not just me, but I think anyone at the college talks to our students that we're all just in a different place in the same path that everyone's trying to find their way, everyone's trying to do something better, and everyone will make it. And once you make it, what are you doing for someone else? And so I'm very lucky. In many ways, I've made, I've had successes beyond I could ever have imagined. And so now it's a matter of service. Now it's a matter of giving back. Now it's a matter of paying it forward to the next group so that they can do some well, of what I've done. You know Daniel Coleman's book, Emotional Intelligence. Yes. I, I assume that you read that, a lot of that kind of stuff. So what part of you do you think is nurture or nature, emotional intelligence? What part of you is just from you or what part of you was encouraged by somebody or something else? Well, I think that it happens in, in bites. I don't think, I don't think people are 100% emotionally intelligent when they start out. And I don't think that, I don't think that, uh, I think your relationship with the world really does enhance your emotional intelligence so that I'm, I'm so very aware of the blessings I've been given. You mentioned Vassar. I went there on a scholarship. Other people gave of themselves so that I would be able to get to where I am. Um, and so there is a deep sense of, of gratefulness uh, for everything that's happened to me in my life. And I think that when you're grateful, um, I think it makes all the difference. So uh, in, a, in a very small answer, nurture or nature for Mark Scheinberg? I, I really think, I think it's a lot of nurture. Nurture. I, I really do think so. I think that, um, I think that you're twisted in a certain way, certainly, and how you react to things is up to the individual, but you're taught to do that. You're taught to react the way you do. So you don't think you were just born with this God-given talent? 
I was given what lots, I was born with lots of gifts. I was born with, with uh, you know, basic intelligence and talent and things like that, that, that it's not something that, that I give myself credit for at all. So if you're, they say to whom much is given, much is expected. I was, I was very, very lucky that a lot of these things happened really easily to me. But I was also helpful that, it was also helpful that pe people took me under their wing as well. So we've been talking to Mark Scheinberg. He says he's a lucky guy, and certainly Goodwin College would reflect that. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Gott mich gut, ich gott mich gut, ich nasche, was geht dobre. Gott mich gut, ich gott mich gut, ich nasche, was geht dobre.